All right, let's get right into it. Uh, welcome. We are going to welcome in Steve Terundolo, the new, newly, re- newly appointed head coach of LAFC. Steve, welcome to the State of the Union podcast. Congratulations. All right, listen, you're in the hot seat. Uh, you're the man. You are the boss. And uh, with that comes responsibility. With that comes expectation. And with that comes the grilling, all right, that maybe you haven't had in the past. So I'm going to start it off right, uh, right off the bat here with a, with a question. All right. Uh, you are youngish. Uh, your track record when it comes to coaching is mostly assistant coaching uh, for a number of years. And when it was head coaching, it was for youth teams uh, until last year with Las Vegas lights. And certainly when you look at the lights with a six win, three draw and 23 loss record wasn't great from a, uh, a record standpoint. Why do you think that you deserve this plum job at LAFC? Because I'm the right person for the job, um, for where we are right now as an organization um, and where we're going, uh, you know, my attributes, my relationships and, uh, you know, also relationships within the building um, are the right pieces to get this uh, project moving forward in the right direction. How does that manifest, though? You say you're the right person. You see that. So give me an, an actual real life on the job type of experience where that intrinsic knowledge and having been around uh, the, the team and the uh, and the identity that's already been formed actually shows up in your day to day working. I know it's early days. I wouldn't have been here if Bob and I and uh, didn't see eye to eye, at least at a philosophical level, as far as football goes. Um, and so, you know, we share many of the same principles and ideas about the game. And so that is um, very easy to continue. Something that we wanted to have here is continuity. Um, and so I think you will see that also with the staff when that is finalized, that we have some continuity moving forward because there is a lot of good to go off of um, at LAFC. Um, but my experiences and my influence in coaching in Europe, um, predominantly with coaches who were very strong in transition, um, will also come to play with this team and to help move us in improving areas that we see improvement. Steve, there, there's an eternal debate in MLS about whether you're better off hiring a manager who understands the intricacies of the league as opposed to an outsider. Now, Ronnie Dyla did just win MLS Cup and Tata won it in 2018. So there have been some success stories for outsiders recently. But what do you make of that debate? And do you feel like with your background, you almost check off both boxes in terms of being an insider and an outsider? It seems you are winning MLS Cups. Um, get the balance in the roster right. Um, and have obviously quality, enough quality to win championships. That's what it comes down to in the, the day. Our coach is important, yeah, but are they the deciding factor? I'm not too sure. So I don't really think the debate is fair. Um, but to answer your question, I do think that I bring an interesting mix. Um, and then if, you know, once our, our staff is finalized, um, we will be well balanced staff wise to have some international experience, some domestic experience. Um, you know, assistant coaches also who will connect with certain players on our team. So we are looking to be well balanced really everywhere on and off the field. Sorry, Steve, you mentioned, you know, kind of the succession planning and the organization behind the scenes that, that involved you. Um, and, and, you know, Bob Bradley, his, his shadow looms large. And I think it still will be, especially in the, in, in the identity, but you're your own man. So you come in, what are some things that you think you're going to continue from Bob Bradley and that identity that he established and some other things that you're going to incorporate uh, in that are new? Well, I think the LAFC identity on the field of uh, attacking minded, wanting to score goals, um, putting teams um, on their heels, I think is something we will continue. We want to continue. I truly believe that's the right way to play if you can and if you have the tools, which we do. Um, But furthermore, I think it's more important to be, um, you know, if you look at the defensive side without having the ball, being proactive is something that's very important to us. Um, A lot of people will just think that that is being um, a high pressing team, keeping a high line. Um, I disagree. You can be proactive by deep defending as well. We can also be very proactive in, in transition, which is a big piece to the puzzle where I think we can improve. Uh, Steve, a player who's been so important to that proactive style of LAFC's last few years has been Carlos Vela. Uh, can you shed some light on his future with the club? There have been some questions this offseason. Uh, is he somebody that you, you want to coach for the next couple of years? You think he'll be with LAFC for the next couple of years? Um, I certainly hope so. And I believe so. I think, um, his talents and tools are, are second to none in this league. I think we've all seen what he can do. Um, you know, he believes in himself. He likes it here. We've had great conversations, but our main point of focus right now is what we can control. And that is, uh, getting Carlos fit and healthy and, and, and getting him on the field, surround him, um, with the best players as possible. 
and then we will see the best out of Carlos again. Steve, can I go back to uh, your, your, your time in, in Las Vegas? And when I say your time in Las Vegas, I know you were kind of commuting and going back and forth, but I'm really interested actually in how this worked out. The relationship and the partnership that was established between these two teams, the, the way I, I don't understand it, so I want you to explain it to me. What was your main focus and responsibility relative to that team, relative to the first team, I guess it would be, in LAFC? Because I want to understand that because they're going to name another coach to Las Vegas, and maybe it's unfair for us from the outside to judge on the record, and in this case, not a very good record, if your responsibilities were different. Yeah, success is relative. And, um, you know, how we define success, uh, everybody does for themselves. And within this organization, success for the Las Vegas Lights last year was to prepare players for the MLS. And um, we believe we did an excellent job of that. We progressed a few players. Uh, Danny Chrysostomo, for example, who started with the Lights, who then moved up and played some uh, crucial minutes. Um, uh, Fall uh, was another example who definitely uh, made a big splash last year in his first season in the MLS. So, um, the objective of ours was to prepare players, as many players as possible for LAFC. And I think we did an excellent job with that. Yeah. Uh, would you like to win a few more games during the season? Absolutely. But I think if we all went back and looked at each game and looked at the rosters, we feel that um, the amount of valuable minutes and lessons that we were able to give very young players last season um, was extremely valuable for these players in their careers and for LAFC moving forward. All right, hold on one, one more question and then we'll, uh, we're going to open it up because I want to really pick your brain about you know, the, the, the soccer landscape in the U.S. and, and uh, especially over in Germany with what's happening over there. One more about, about Las Vegas. So if that's the objective in this relationship and in this uh, partnership right now, if somebody is calling me to be a season ticket holder for Las Vegas, is the pitch that you are seeing the future of LAFC or is the pitch, hey, this is great quality soccer. We're here to win championships and we're doing everything to get the best possible product on the day for that team. It's both. So, so year one of that relationship was always going to be an uphill battle, um, which we saw result wise. I think developmental wise in, in, in uh, developing players was, was fantastic. We were very happy with that. Um, moving into this next season, getting a better understanding of obviously the USL, the league, um, and preparing a team to compete and to play a bigger role um, in the league, in our division, um, we are much, much uh, further and ahead of the game. And I think all the Las Vegas, Las, Vegas, Las Vegas Lights fans will be extremely pleased and happy and proud of the team we'll be feeling this year. Let's pick your brain a little bit then about, because you are, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, an expert when it comes uh, to Germany and to the Bundesliga with your incredible career and your incredible, uh, incredible experience even off the field. Why do you think that Germany has been such so open to the American player and uh, in particular, and, and obviously a lot of talk right now is uh, Ricardo Pepe and what's happening uh, with him right now. Um, how do you think he is ultimately going to go do in that environment? And I guess it's specifically for the team that he's going to in Augsburg. To succeed and survive in, in the Bundesliga environment with, you know, within the club, the coaching, the training is very intense. Um, the critique and feedback is very intense. And so I think an American player, um, usually believing in himself, uh, we'll just generalize for a minute, uh, believing in himself, having a strong mentality, um, losing, getting up, and then fighting again, I think that goes a long way in, in the Bundesliga in the eyes of, of German coaches, which is why they really like to bring American players over. Um, on top of that, you add in most American players are technically well-rounded, um, have a very good foundation in the United States and athletically um, bring a lot to the table. So those three components are very important. The Germans are also very adamant about their tactical training. They believe uh, they can teach any player anything uh, and teach them the German way. And so they believe they can add that last element to an American player. So I think this is why uh, most German clubs and coaches are very open to American players. And Steve, playing off of that, there is this debate right now about what MLS's role should be in the global transfer market. Should MLS embrace being a quote unquote selling league? Um, how do you view that? If with LAFC, you have a couple of young, promising American players that are attracting interest overseas, would you encourage them to go or would you fight to keep them because you, they can help you win with LAFC? How, how do you view that sort of balancing act as a coach in MLS? Um, I'm not sure that that's an MLS topic as it is an individual club topic. I think every club has to understand their role in this league um, domestically, but also globally and, and, and make decisions accordingly. I think if you have a, a game plan as a club, what do you want to be? Do you want to be a club who will develop players and then sell them? Um, 
invest into um, high top prospects, develop them further, and then sell them. You know, that is a business model that works, and we've seen it in every league around the world. Uh, for example, Borussia Dortmund in, in the Bundesliga at a different level, uh, you know, their payroll is very high, but their game business model is to buy the best player, young player in the world, develop them, and then sell them on to the big five clubs. So I think identifying that role for yourself as a club is, is, uh, is extremely important. Um, and so to answer your question has less to do with the MLS approach than it does an individual club approach. All right, let's uh, let's switch to the uh, the international game. Uh, you are a former international, very very successful. You know what it takes to uh, not just individually be successful, but also what it takes for a team. Our U.S. team right now, our U.S. men's team, coached by Greg Berhalter, sitting pretty right now in second place. Still plenty of work to work to do. When you look at the team right now, where it is, and I guess expand it out to where it, it is going, uh, does it does it warm the cockles of your heart like it does mine? It absolutely does. So standings. Um, I think getting our, play, our players, our team in the, in the right spot as far as points and, and uh, creating a comfortable situation in CONCACAF, which both you and I know is very difficult, um, especially on the road, um, was the kind of last piece of the puzzle. We saw for a long time in the past few years um, the way they're playing, the ideas they want, you know, are, are progressive, are the right choice, in my opinion, to move this thing forward. Um, and we saw some incredibly talented players. It was a big bet to just go young. Uh, but I think this team and what I'm seeing, and, and, and like I said, you know, the key to being successful with the U.S. national team is finding a core of guys that truly like being around each other. And, and I'm seeing this um, from my screen. Um, I don't know what's going on inside the locker room, but from my screen, I am seeing a connection. And that will go a long way in uh, solidifying these results we're seeing moving forward for the next year. Steve, how far can the U.S. national team go, say, in the 2022 or 2026 World Cups? Megan Rapino came out recently and said everybody needs to calm down a little bit. There's a lot of excitement there, but I think the U.S. men are still 15 years away from being able to challenge for a World Cup title. Uh, is that your view, or do you feel like she's selling the men's program short a little bit and that we could already see this collection of players be a contender, uh, maybe even as early as 22, but, but perhaps more realistically, 2026? As much as we would like to plan this out and, and to say <laughs> we will be World Cup champions in 26, that would be fantastic. Um, you will never hear that from me. It, this game <laughs> is, is so hard to plan. Um, I, I think um, a lot of it has to do with the draw. It has to do with, for anybody who's been to World Cup or, or follows them very closely, you just have to be informed for four weeks. And the team who is informed for four weeks and allows very few mistakes ends up being the World Cup champion if they have obviously the talent and the pedigree uh, to win those games. So a lot goes into current form and that is extremely important in this. So do we have players to have a very successful World Cup? Yeah, I do believe we can have a fantastic World Cup. But ask me that question uh, a week prior to the World Cup again, please. All right, let's finish it up with just a couple of quick questions that I have for you. Um, one, uh, just yes or no, does the U.S. men's national team qualify for the World Cup in Qatar 2022? Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Uh, number two, does LAFC uh, make the playoffs in 2022? Yes. Okay, perfect. And then finally, my last question to you, what are you going to wear on the sideline? All right. This is always up for debate. We were just talking about Greg Burhalter and, you know, his style. Bob and I go back a long way when it comes to what to wear on the sideline and all that. And I actually think he's evolved in his, in his thinking and in his wardrobe out there. What do you have planned for the LAFC faithful and all of us that are watching from the outside from your on, uh, on sideline attire? Uh, you know what? I will, I will wear what I usually wear on a day-to-day -day basis. So it'll be, it'll be casual, but it will be, uh, um, I guess the right mix for the occasion, maybe a little bit of European uh, mixed in there, a European fitting, not quite as much as uh, your, your partner in crime, Stewie, not as tight as this <laughs> one, but, uh, but definitely uh, I would say just smart casual if you want to, if you want to put a word on it. Are you, are you a sneaker head well, in terms of your shoe game? Yes. After playing a long career, um, I have no other option. Uh, there's nothing else that's comfortable for me to stand there for 90 minutes or 90 minutes plus. So well, yeah. you know, your friend Greg Berhalter, he's bringing it when it comes to the shoe game uh, over there. Steve <laughs> Turundlo, thank you so much for being on the State of the Union podcast. I wish you all the luck in the world. Um, look forward to seeing you on that side. And we look forward to seeing what LAFC is going to be. Uh, congratulations. Welcome. Welcome back. And uh, onward and up, my, upward, my friend. Thank you. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.